Thank you to everyone for joining today's webinar. I'd also like to thank the funders of Cochrane Canada, without whom these webinars, our training, systematic reviews, and capacity building could not happen. Thank you to CIHR for their support. I'd also like to thank PAHO for kindly providing the Blackboard software for our webinars. And a special thank you to Luis Gabriel Cuervo, who converts our webinars to YouTube videos. The recorded webinars are generally available online from two to eight weeks following the webinar. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's session on overviews of reviews, what they are, what they aren't, and how and when to do one. We'll be hearing from three speakers today, Denise Thompson, Michelle Foisy, and Lisa Hartling. Denise Thompson is the coordinator of the Child, Cochrane Child Health Field and the managing editor of Evidence-Based Child Health, a Cochrane Review Journal. Evidence-Based Child Health has published over 30 overviews of reviews carried out according to the format in the Cochrane Handbook for Systematic Reviews of Interventions. Denise's part of the webinar will focus on practical aspects of managing and evaluating overviews of reviews. Michelle Foisy has previously worked as a research assistant with the Cochrane Child Health Field, where her main role involved coordinating and conducting overviews of reviews for the journal Evidence-Based Child Health. She now works as a project coordinator with the Alberta Research Center for Health Evidence, where she conducts research examining the methods used within overviews of reviews. Lisa Hartling is the director of the Cochrane Child Health Field and director of the Alberta Research Center for Health Evidence. She is a systematic reviewer with seven Cochrane Review Groups and a member of the Bias Methods Group. Lisa has been involved in conducting knowledge syntheses and methodological research around issues in knowledge syntheses for over 10 years. Lisa, over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I just want to first declare that we have no commercial conflicts of interest to declare. And I'm going to start by just giving an introduction to overviews and an introduction to the session today. Um, but before I start that, I have a question for the audience just so I have a better sense of who we're speaking to. So our question for you is, have you ever conducted A, a systematic review, B, an overview of reviews, C, both of the above, and D, neither of the above? So we'll just give you some time to um, put in your answers. I see lots of respondents so far. We'll give it a few more seconds here. Okay, and my poll shows that um, uh, a lot of you have been doing this, have done a systematic review in the past, and uh, as well a fair amount have, have done either a systematic review or an overview of reviews, um, and only 3% have actually done an overview of reviews. So thank you very much for participating in that. So our objectives with today's talk is to uh, discuss what is an overview of reviews, um, and this is based largely on our experience in doing these over the past number of years. Uh, Denise will talk about when to do an overview of reviews. Michelle will talk about how you actually conduct an overview of reviews. And then I'll wrap up with things to think about before undertaking an overview of reviews. So we started doing overviews of reviews uh, back in 2006, and at that time, the Cochrane Collaboration referred to these as umbrella reviews, and largely because they were brought in scope and brought together a number of different systematic reviews on a topic. Um, we started doing them because one of our key deliverables for the Cochrane Child Health field is knowledge translation. And we developed, or we started a journal back in 2006 called Evidence-Based Child Health, a Cochrane Review Journal. And in each issue of the journal, we developed and, and um, published an overview of reviews. So what is an overview of reviews? We actually did a descriptive analysis looking at the medical literature um, from 2000 to 2011 and looked for published overviews of reviews. And by that, we were defining these broadly as reviews of systematic reviews. And we noticed across that time that the number of overviews um, increased dramatically over that period. Um, 
but uh, there was a large variation in those overviews. So there was variation in what they were called. There was a lot of variation in the terminology. For example, these things may have been called summary of Cochrane reviews or systematic review of systematic reviews. Um, sometimes we saw overview of systematic reviews or even systematic meta review. So a real variation in the terminology. We also found uh, extensive variation in how these overviews were approached, so in terms of the methods. So what we're speaking to today is largely uh, the methods that we have followed over the years, and they have evolved um, as we've gained more experience since we started doing these back in 2006. So we're defining an overview of reviews um, as a, an overview that compiles information from multiple systematic reviews in order to provide a comprehensive synthesis of the evidence. So these can focus on different interventions for the same condition, and I have that highlighted in blue because that's been the primary focus of the overviews that we have produced for our evidence-based child health journal. They can, however, also look at different outcomes for the same intervention in the same condition. They could also look at the same intervention for different conditions or populations. And as well, they can look at adverse effects across multiple conditions. And I've also highlighted that in blue because we've, uh, we're recently starting an overview with that focus uh, for EBCH. So overviews use systematic and explicit methods as with systematic reviews. Currently, the majority of overviews, certainly what we do and what we've seen in the medical literature, provide a narrative or qualitative synthesis of the results presented in the included systematic reviews. The Cochrane Multiple Interventions Methods Group advises that overviews should not simply summarize systematic reviews, but rather they should integrate and synthesize the evidence. So I've provided a table here uh, just to try and, and clarify what we're referring to as a systematic review versus an overview of reviews. So the de definition I've provided for a systematic review comes from the glossary for the Cochrane Handbook, and it's defined as a review of a clearly formulated question that uses systematic and explicit methods to identify, select, and critically appraise relevant research, and to collect, collect and analyze data from the studies that are included in the review. An overview of reviews, this definition comes from the Cochrane Handbook, is considered a review is designed to compile evidence from multiple systematic reviews of interventions into one accessible and usable document. So again, the aim to distinguish these two products, the systematic review really focuses on the individual studies, so the unit of analysis is the primary study, whereas an overview of reviews aims to synthesize information from individual systematic reviews. So the unit of analysis is the systematic review. In terms of the type of analysis, in a systematic review, we may see a meta-analysis, um, and this is typically, typically involves a direct or head-to-head -head comparison. So it might be a comparison of treatment A to treatment B or treatment A to placebo. A systematic review could include a network meta-analysis, um, and this is an evolving, more sophisticated analysis that includes both the direct, the head-to-head -head comparison, as well as indirect evidence into the same analysis. An overview of reviews, um, as I've mentioned, often reports the results um, as analyzed in the component systematic reviews. However, it can reanalyze the data using meta-analysis, and it can also include a network meta-analysis, although, as I've said already, we don't often see this currently in overviews of reviews. Currently, there's no method methodological standards or reporting guidelines for overviews of reviews, although this is something that we're working towards at my research center. Um, the Cochrane Handbook in Part 3, Chapter 22, does provide some guidance in how to conduct an overview of reviews, and the handbook is available online um, free of charge. So I'm going to pass you over now to Denise, and she will be talking about when you might want to do an overview of reviews. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Um, um, I'm Denise Thompson, and I'm the coordinator of the Child Health Field, um, and I'm based at the University of Alberta along with Lisa and Michelle. And my experience is with, is with the coordination of overviews. 
And so I have some uh, guidance based on that experience about kind of the overall task of uh, framing and, uh, and actually producing an overview. So basically, um, when would you do an overview? Um, and so the, the, the choice of when to do an overview is um, when it is a, it's a great choice when what you're looking to do is map the available evidence. Um, by which I mean bring together the, the evidence um, relevant to your clinical question. Uh, generally, uh, what are the interventions that exist for this particular uh, condition? And so you want to bring that evidence together, but with no attempt to rank the interventions. And so kind of a very short history of the idea of overviews, of reviews within the Cochrane collaboration is that they were uh, thought of as a friendly front end, by which we mean they would provide the reader with a quick uh, overview of the Cochrane reviews that were relevant to a clinical decision and at the same time an exhaustive list of those Cochrane reviews. So that, for example, you could read one overview on um, interventions for bronchiolitis rather than having to read you know, 10 or 11 Cochrane reviews um, covering all those different interventions. So it was, it was meant as, as just that, that easy way into what's the Cochrane evidence on this topic. Um, so I would, I would say there's four preconditions for doing um, an overview. One is the topic is clinically relevant. Um, and uh, that, that's a very important one, of course. Um, second, that um, there have to be reviews, systematic reviews available on all the major interventions. Um, otherwise, there will be a gap in what your overview is presenting, and that will very much limit the, the usefulness, the clinical usefulness of your overview. Uh, third is the systematic reviews have to be current. Um, so there's not much point. We've had a few very promising um, overview topics derailed because, you know, all of a sudden a new uh, trial will get published in The Lancet that uh, changes the evidence so much that the systematic review is out of date and therefore you, uh, you can't proceed with the overview. Um, and um, Many overviews within, uh, certainly the ones published on the Cochrane Library, are produced by Cochrane Review Groups. And so if it's a Cochrane Review Group, that's what I mean by the, the CRG um, acronym there, and I'm sorry I should have spelled that out, um, but that means Cochrane Review Group, and if it's a Cochrane Review Group producing the overview, it has to be aligned with the group's current priorities for what's um, the most important topics to be covering at any given time. So um, I'm the, I, as I said, I'm speaking from the point of view of somebody who manages the process of producing an overview. Um, so my perspective is probably useful for um, people like managing editors of review groups, for example, or other coordinators. But I think generally also useful for um, authors in general um, because it's some things to think about ahead of time, really. And one, uh, this one, I just can't emphasize enough to beware of the common assumption that overviews are easy and straightforward. Um, a lot of people sort of assume, well, really all you're doing is bringing together systematic reviews. The hard work has been done when you produce the systematic review. And I'm here to say, having coordinated over 30 overviews of reviews, that, um, that they're not as easy and straightforward as you would think. There's, there's always quirks and questions that come up along the way. Um, and uh, so you, you want to be well prepared for those. Um, and um, you need a complete author team, the same uh, breadth of author team that you would need for a systematic review. Um, and um, that would, you need to have uh, clinicians, um, methods experts, uh, statistician on hand to advise on, um, on that, and an information specialist, so someone who's skilled at searching and retrieving. Um, 
you need to give yourself a realistic time frame. These are big projects, so um, you need to treat them accordingly. And if you're in the position of needing to find peer reviewers for overviews, um, my advice would be you need to, it's not as easy to find good peer reviewers as you might like. You need people who not only understand the clinical area, but also understand systematic reviews and understand what the point is of an overview of reviews. Um, I've had a couple of experiences of sending overviews out for peer review and getting um, comments back that this really doesn't look like anything more than a synthesis of some existing systematic reviews and um, you know, that's exactly what an overview is, but of course, but if the peer reviewer doesn't understand that, then they're going to have difficulty peer reviewing and that can um, be difficult if you're trying to manage a project towards publication. Um, and probably the twist on that for authors would be um, if you're writing up an overview to, um, to very clearly delineate um, in your write-up what it is you're trying to do because it is, as Lisa mentioned, a fairly new format and so not everyone will really get right away what, what's going on. Um, and it's possible to do some creative things with the overview format, um, some creative and useful things. Um, and I'll just illustrate that point with a couple of examples from, um, from the body of overviews that the Child Health Field has done. Um, as I mentioned, we've published over 30 of them now, so we've, we've um, had some opportunities to, uh, to push the format a little bit. Um, and one is that one way you can use an overview quite usefully is to address conditions that aren't explicitly addressed in the reviews you're including. And um, one way we did that was doing an overview on interventions for sore throat um, that pulled from, um, from data on, uh, presented in reviews in, um, on six different topics that are listed there. Um, and so, but as you can see, none of those systematic reviews set out um, to be a systematic review on sore throat. So we pulled bits and pieces from there and were able to bring that together. Another time we did that was an overview of reviews on chronic abdominal pain. And uh, we were very interested in that topic because it's an important topic in pediatrics um, that kids show up in uh, casualty departments, emergency departments, um, or at their, their uh, family doctor or at their pediatrician's office with sore tummies. And it can be quite difficult sometimes for a doctor to figure out what's going on. Um, so we pulled together, as you can see, a, a wide range of data there as well. Um, aimed at uh, addressing what was a, a, an important topic in pediatrics. Um, so uh, I, uh, I know at the outset of this we did a poll and, and many of you are not some, um, uh, Cochrane authors so you may not be aware of um, the difference between fields and review groups but um, fields uh, within Cochrane have uh, cross-cutting responsibilities. We cover a really broad area and that means we can have a, uh, a great perspective to bring to overviews and uh, one is that we can synthesize reviews that were produced by more than one Cochrane review group um, and uh, another is that uh, we can produce overviews that are aimed at a specific population rather than a, um, at specific uh, conditions. So that's something that, uh, that, that fields can bring to that whole topic. So hopefully that was a, a good overview of some of, uh, sorry, to <laughs> a good um, presentation of some of the, uh, the practical aspects of coordinating an overview. And now I'd, I'll turn it over to Michelle to take you through the, the in-depth how to do one. We do have one question here. Do Cochrane Review Groups only accept overviews of Cochrane Systematic Reviews? Oh, thanks, Michelle, um, or Catherine. Um, and um, the, uh, yes, the, I, as a general rule, Cochrane review groups um, only do overviews synthesizing um, Cochrane reviews, yes.
anyone else has any questions, you can submit them through the chat room. And just to let you know, the slides will be available after the session. We'll send them around through email. So uh, now that we've talked about what an overview is, and Lisa and Denise have really talked us through that, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about how to actually conduct an overview of reviews. So today I want to walk you through some of the steps that are involved in conducting an overview. And overviews actually follow the same steps as a systematic review, but there are some differences in the execution of these steps. So today I want to talk about issues related to the scope, the search strategy, screening and inclusion, and then I want to focus most of my talk on issues related to data extraction and the presentation of results. So just as you would when conducting a systematic review, the first step when conducting an overview is to clearly define the scope of your overview. And what the child health field does is we generally choose a, a general topic before contacting potential authors and clinicians who are experts in that topic and who know the field well. Uh, the clinicians then refine the scope based on their clinical expertise, and this involves pre-specifying the populations, interventions, comparators, and outcomes of interest. And refining the scope and pre-specifying the PICO components really ensures that future steps are driven by a well-defined clinical question and not by whatever data appears in the individual reviews. The last thing to consider when determining the scope of your overview is whether you want to include Cochrane reviews only or whether you want to include both Cochrane and non-Cochrane reviews in your overview. And this is something that you should consider carefully because including non-Cochrane reviews uh, will really increase the complexity of your overview. So just to give you an example of what I mean by this, imagine that you wanted to conduct an overview looking at interventions for the treatment of bronchiolitis in infants. If you were including only Cochrane reviews in your overview, you would find that there was one review looking at, looking at uh, treatment with bronchodilators, one review looking at epinephrine, one looking at glucocorticoids, and so on. Um, and that's because Cochrane really tries hard to avoid duplication. So if you're including only Cochrane reviews, you'll find that there's a maximum of one review per intervention of interest. However, if you were to include non-Cochrane reviews as well, you would find that there are actually four reviews looking at treatment with bronchodilators. And this can get really tricky because these overlapping reviews will also contain overlapping trials. And this could lead to double counting data if you were to include all of those reviews in your overview. So then the question becomes how to decide whether to include Cochrane reviews only or non-Cochrane reviews as well. And our advice would be that if you can answer your clinical question using only the Cochrane reviews, or if you're uncomfortable grappling with some of these issues involved in inclusion of non-Cochrane reviews, then we would recommend sticking to just the Cochrane reviews only. However, if there's an important gap in the Cochrane evidence that might be better addressed in the non-Cochrane literature, then it might be worth it to include the non-Cochrane reviews as well. In terms of the search strategy, uh, a search for an overview is typically simpler than a search for a systematic review, and that's because, of course, we're searching for reviews and not primary trials. If you're including only Cochrane reviews, there's only one database that you'll need to search, and that is the Cochrane database of systematic reviews. And we also recommend contacting relevant Cochrane review groups because they can help identify any reviews that you might have missed. Um, we also recommend contacting protocol authors as well because the review might almost be completed and it might be possible to obtain a pre-publication version of this review uh, to include in your overview. And we found that authors are normally very happy to provide us with pre-publication versions and the advantage for the overview author is that these pre-publication versions will be really up to date as well. Uh, if you're including non-Cochrane reviews as well, then you'll need to determine which additional databases you want to search. And you can also experiment with different systematic review search filters to help restrict your search to reviews only. So screening is also not as complex at the overview level because there's typically less reviews to screen and because you're typically only screening for the population. So making sure that the review is looking at the right disorder, the right age group, and any other population factors that you pre-specify as important. 
it's less common to screen for the interventions, comparators, and outcomes. And that's because, as Lisa discussed earlier, overviews are normally looking at multiple interventions for one condition. So we normally want to be more inclusive for these types of overviews. Now, in terms of inclusion, if you're only including Cochrane reviews in your overview, Inclusion is relatively straightforward because, as I mentioned, there will typically only be one review per intervention of interest. So all of the reviews that you identify during your screening phase will end up being included in your overview. It does get a bit trickier if you're including non-Cochrane reviews as well because then you'll have to determine how you want to deal with overlapping reviews. So I mentioned before that we really want to avoid double counting data. And the easiest way to do this is to only include one review per intervention. And this is what the child health field has done when, include, when including non-Cochrane reviews. Uh, but then that leaves the question of deciding which review you want to include. And there is no one right answer for this. There's many different things you could do. So you could end up including the Cochrane review if there is one. Or alternatively, you might want to include the most recent review, potentially the highest quality review, or maybe the review that contributes the most outcome data. And since there is no one right answer for this, it's important that whatever you decide to do, you document it so that it's very transparent in the methods what you did. So now that I've talked about issues related to the scope, the search strategy, screening, and inclusion, I want to really focus on the data extraction and the presentation of results. And the child health field typically uses a standard results section that consists of the four subheadings that you see here. So for the, for the remainder of my talk, what I want to do is discuss each of these in more detail, beginning with the description of included reviews section. Now, this is a section that's unique to overviews. It's not something that you have to consider when conducting a systematic review. And there's six types of information that we think are important to include in this section. So the first is basic review information, such as the title, authors, and the date that the review was last assessed is up to date. Uh, you also want to report the overall study information, such as the number of included studies in each review, as well as the study designs. And for each review, it's important to report the pooled sample size, as well as the size of the smallest and largest studies within that review. Uh, search strategy. It's important to report the databases and other resources searched, as well as the search dates. And that's because this will allow you to determine how comprehensive the searches were within each review and also how comparable the searches were across reviews. Uh, next is participant information, so age, demographics, as well as the specific definition of the disorder. Because different reviews might define the same disorder in different ways. And again, it's important to determine how similar the definitions are across your included reviews. Uh, fifth is interventions, so how many and which ones are included in your overview, as well as the number of trials looking at each intervention. And then finally, you want to report the outcome measures, so which outcomes are included in the reviews, how are they defined, and when were they measured. And this can be a lot of information to include in one section of your manuscript, so we found that the best way to uh, present this information is using a combination of in-text descriptions combined with a table of included reviews. So this is an example of a characteristics of included reviews table. And this is taken from our bronchiolitis overview, so interventions for bronchiolitis in infants. And you can see a lot of the information that I talked about on the previous slide is included here. So we start off with some basic review and study information. That's followed by uh, information about the participants and the disorder, and then general information about the interventions, comparators, and outcomes. And an advantage of this table format is that it allows you to easily compare the review characteristics across your included reviews. But you may have noticed that a lot of the things I talked about on the previous slide are not included here. And that's where the in-text descriptions really complement the table format. The second part of the results section is the methodological quality of included reviews section. And this is assessed using the ANSTAR tool, which is a measurement tool to assess the quality of systematic reviews. 
This tool consists of 11 different quality criteria, such as whether the review assessed publication bias and whether there was duplicate study selection and data extraction. And it can be a little bit tricky to use at times, but it's recommended by Cochrane and it's the current gold standard for assessing the review quality. Um, in the past, we haven't always assessed the quality of the included reviews when we've included only Cochrane reviews. And that's because we've more or less assumed that Cochrane reviews are high quality. But where this becomes more relevant is when you're also including non-Cochrane reviews and the quality of these reviews is unknown. And it also becomes relevant if you decide to use review quality as one of your inclusion criteria. So the third part of the results is the methodological quality of included studies. And it's important to note that trial quality will have already been assessed in your included reviews. But reviews often use many different tools to assess trial quality. So for example, some reviews use the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool, but even within this tool there's a lot of variation in how this is reported. So some reviews might only report some of the standard risk of bias dimensions or maybe even just allocation concealment, whereas other reviews will report additional dimensions on top of the standard criteria. And then other reviews will use a completely different tool, such as the Haddad tool, although Cochrane is now discouraging the use of this tool, so hopefully in the future there will be decreased variability in the tools used to assess trial quality. So, if reviews are using so many different tools to assess trial quality, then the question is how to present the quality of studies in an overview. And that will depend on the individual review. If possible, we would recommend reporting the quality assessments as they're presented in each review. And the child health field has been able to do this almost all of the time, even though it does sometimes get a little bit messy. Um, if it's not possible to report the assessments in each review, then you can also go back to the original trials and re-extract the quality assessments yourself. And the advantage of this is that even though it takes a bit more time, you'll often end up with a cleaner end product. The fourth part of the results section is the effective intervention section, and this is where you present your outcome data. So like I've said before, and I really want to emphasize, data extraction should be driven by a well-defined question and not by the individual review data. And you can do this by defining your outcomes a priori, choosing in advance whether you want to use fixed or random effect modeling, and choosing in advance whether you want to present risk ratios or odds ratios, and whether you want mean differences or standardized mean differences. So in terms of the actual data extraction, you'll typically need to re-extract data from reviews, and this can be done pretty easily using Review Manager. And the reason for this is that not all data will be presented in a format that's useful to you. So I'm going to get into this a little bit later on, but to give a really simple example that we just talked about, if you wanted to present risk ratios in your overview, but some of the reviews presented the data as odds ratios, then you would have to re-enter the data into Review Manager to convert it to the correct measure of effect. Uh, in terms of reporting results, it's important to present data by outcome and not by intervention. We typically don't include forest plots and overviews just because it's easy to imagine that this would get really bulky and we don't want to overwhelm the reader. So instead, we've presented data in text and in tables. And then the last thing to think about is grade assessments. So in the past, we haven't always done this because not many reviews reported grade assessments, so we weren't able to extract these assessments from the reviews. But recently, Cochrane has stated that grade assessments are now required in reviews, so hopefully in the future it will be a little bit easier to extract these assessments from the reviews. But if you're interested in using the grade tool in your overview, it's possible to apply grade at the overview level as well. So to help tie everything together, this is an example of an effective interventions table, and it's taken from our overview of reviews on bronchiolitis. And for this overview, we had pre-specified that we wanted to present data from outpatients, inpatients, and ICU patients separately. So what you're looking at here is the outpatient outcomes, and we also had a similar table for inpatients and ICU patients as well. 
So you can see in the first column we present the pre-specified outcomes and that's followed by the comparisons examining those outcomes. And then the, quali the quantitative information, so the measure of effect, the number of subjects and studies, the I-squared value for heterogeneity, and then we finish off with the grade assessment. So this is a pretty standard data table, but what I haven't talked about yet is how to actually extract data and some of the issues that might come up if you're extracting data. So that's kind of what I want to get into next. And one of the questions that might come up is you might be wondering if you should ever go back to the original trials to extract additional data that might not have been presented in the review. And there's no definitive answer to this, but we do try to avoid this if possible, just because our goal is not to redo the actual review. But uh, a good question to ask yourself is, will extracting the additional information enhance the quality of your final product? Or on the other hand, will not extracting the information diminish the quality of your overview? So to give you an example of what I mean by this, um, going back to the bronchiolitis overview, I had stated that we wanted to present inpatient, outpatient, and ICU data separately, but not all of the reviews that were included in this overview specified the patient population. So in cases where the patient population was not specified, we decided to go back to the original trial to determine the patient population, and then all of our trials were able to be classified as inpatient, outpatient, or ICU. Now another question that might come up is what if not all of the trials in your included review are relevant to your clinical question? And an example of this would be an overview of reviews on sore throat that we conducted. Uh, we were interested in looking at sore throat in children only, but when we looked at our included reviews, we found that actually about half of the trials in these reviews were looking at adult data, which we were not interested in. So the question to ask yourself here is whether the data from the relevant trials can be extracted separately from the data that you're not interested in. And if it can, then it's completely okay to use the relevant data only, and we would actually strongly encourage you to do so. So to give you an example, this is part of the characteristics of included reviews table that was included in our sore throat overview. And the review that we're looking at here looks at antibiotics for the common cold. And you can see that this review included 11 different trials, but only five of those trials were conducted in children only. And those were the five trials that we wanted to include. So looking at the sample size column, you can see that we presented data uh, for all of the studies as well as for the child studies only. And this is a really transparent way of reporting because it allows the reader to see exactly what you did at the overview level. In keeping with that same idea, if you're only including a subset of trials in your overview, then you'll also need to alter the meta-analyses presented in the included reviews to capture only the trials that you're interested in. And I really want to emphasize that it's okay to alter these meta-analyses that are presented in the included reviews. Now, I'm not talking about altering the trial data. The raw data doesn't change. But it's the combination of trials that are included in the meta-analysis that might change. Uh, so for example, you might want to use only a subset of all meta-analyzed trials. And this is what we're interested in doing in the sore throat overview. We wanted to include only the child data and not the adult data. Or uh, going the opposite way, there may be a situation where you want to combine the results from two meta-analyses together into one. So now I want to walk you through an example of how you would go about extracting a subgroup of data from a meta-analysis. And this meta-analysis is taken directly from the review looking at antibiotics for the common cold. The outcome that we're looking at here is adverse effects. And of course, we're interested in the child data only. So if you look on the right, you can see that the first four trials contained only adult data. And we were not interested in including those trials in our overview. We wanted to include only the last two trials, which contained the data in children. So those are the two trials that we wanted to re-extract and include in our overview. So what I did in this case was I took the data that circled here and I re-entered the raw data into Review Manager. 
And after rerunning this analysis with just the two included trials, you see that you end up with a risk ratio of 0 0.81. And that's the value that we wanted to include in our overview. So this is a copy of the adverse effects table that was included in our sore throat overview. And you can see the outcome of interest is extracted in green. So that's an example of how you would go about extracting child-only data from an overview that in, from a review that includes both child and adult data. But I want to emphasize that this can be applied to any population that you're interested in. So going back to the bronchiolitis example, if a review would have presented outpatient and inpatient data together in the same meta-analysis, what we did is we extracted the outpatient data only and presented that data. And then we extracted the inpatient data only and presented that data separately. So I really hope through my talk that I've made it clear that overviews are not just sequential summaries of all systematic reviews that have been conducted in an area of interest. Instead, we're really aiming to synthesize data. We want to combine relevant data and present it in a way that best answers a unique question that hasn't been addressed in any individual review. And the goal of an overview is to end up with a unique end product that builds from the strengths of the included reviews, while at the same time being greater than the sum of its parts. So with that in mind, I'm going to pass you off to Lisa for a few final words. Thanks, Michelle. So I'm just going to summarize with um, a, a few things to think about before conducting an overview of reviews if you're thinking about doing one. Um, and some of this just builds on what um, Denise and Michelle have already mentioned. So the first thing to consider is, is your search. And I think it's really important to consider ahead of time, um, as Michelle has referred to, whether or not you're going to include Cochrane only or both Cochrane and non-Cochrane reviews. Um, if you're including non-Cochrane reviews, then I think it's important to, to decide beforehand how you plan to handle multiple reviews on the same topic. In particular, you may come across a situation where a review or multiple reviews on the same topic have discordant results or conclusions. And um, it's important to not be driven by those results and conclusions, but to know ahead of time how you might handle um, that situation. And there are different options, and there's no one right answer. You may include all relevant reviews, or you may select one. And again, I think it's important to, uh, a priori, determine how you are going to select a single review if that's the route you decide to take. Um, and some of the options, and Michelle has discussed these as well, is maybe taking the one that's the most up-to-date or the most comprehensive or the one that's most methodologically rigorous. Um, and again, beforehand, it's important to consider how are you going to um, uh, assess the methodological quality and what threshold will you set for inclusion into the overview. Another thing to think about is, is to anticipate heterogeneity in the methods across reviews. Um, as Denise said, this isn't as simple a process <laughs> as it might appear at the outset. Um, anticipate that there will be different approaches across systematic reviews, across the different author teams, um, in terms of a number of methods, including the risk of bias assessments, um, whether or not they've graded the evidence, and if they have, how they've graded the evidence, and how they've analyzed the data. I've seen two systematic reviews on the exact same topic. One chose to pool data across the trials. Another chose not to pool data across the trials. Um, across different reviews, you'll see different summary measures used in terms of one might use an odds ratio, another might use a risk ratio. Um, and as well, they may use different uh, models or different statistical approaches. So it's important to think ahead of time what do you want to present and what's most um, relevant, what are the methods most relevant to, to present um, and to answer your PICO that you've established at the outset of the overview. Finally, thinking about the methods for analysis ahead of time. So there are several different options. You could present the results as they are presented in the systematic review without altering them at all. You could reanalyze the data specific to your clinical 
question, as Michelle has gone through, or with common methods. So you may alter a meta-analysis so that you have consistent summary measures um, across the, 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 the results that you report. You may choose to consider a network meta-analysis. We haven't discussed this in this presentation, but there is going to be a webinar um, in the new year on network meta-analysis. Just to mention that this isn't typically done at present in overviews of reviews. Um, it has been done, but we don't commonly do it and we don't commonly see it. There are several key assumptions that need to be met in order to do a network meta-analysis. Of primary importance is that there needs to be um, significant um, homogeneity across the trials so that it makes sense to combine them in a, a single analysis. And I would just advise if you're thinking about doing this um, to involve a statistician. As I mentioned at the outset, there's currently no methodological standards uh, for either conducting an overview or for reporting an overview. Um, I will refer you to the methodological standards for Cochrane intervention reviews, known as Messier, and these standards are available on the Cochrane website. And what they do is, is highlight um, different methods in a systematic review that should be followed, um, and I think many of these are applicable uh, to conducting an overview as well. I would also recommend looking at PRISMA, that's the Preferred Reporting Items for Systematic Reviews and Meta-Analysis. It's a reporting guideline, again, specific to systematic reviews, but again, I think we can apply some of those elements to an overview of reviews. And in fact, in the paper I mentioned earlier where we looked at overviews of reviews that have been published in the medical literature, we have included as appendices um, the tables from the Messier and Prisma guidelines and identified which elements are relevant to an overview and how we might handle those in an overview. So, so for example, Messier suggests that um, two individuals um, independently screen studies for inclusion, and we think that's highly relevant to an overview context as well, where two individuals would screen systematic reviews for inclusion in an overview. Likewise, with the reporting guideline, the first item in the PRISMA statement suggests that um, the report should be identified as a systematic review or meta-analysis or both. And again, we think that's highly relevant to the reporting of an overview where it should be made clear in the title that this is an overview of reviews. We've highlighted a few resources where you might learn more information about this. So the Comparing Multiple Interventions Methods group, uh, and uh, they have listed the website there where they have more information on this. I've mentioned earlier that the Cochrane Handbook has a chapter on overview, uh, overviews of reviews. Um, the main author on this is Lauren Becker, and he worked with us closely over uh, many years when we were developing overview re overviews for the Evidence-Based Child Health Journal. And as well, uh, we've uh, provided the website for the Evidence-Based Child Health Journal where we have published um, over 30 overviews now. In closing, I just want to acknowledge the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. They provide a grant for Cochrane Canada, and through that comes funding specific for the child health field. I'm a new investigator with salary support from CIHR, and I also hold a methods grant from CIHR right now that Michelle is managing, looking at how we can um, improve and better define the methods for overviews of reviews. So thanks, everyone, for attending today and listening to us, and we will Thank take you, questions. Thank you, Lisa. And um, before we move on to questions, I just want to let everyone know that I'm sending the evaluation link through the chat room, and we'd really appreciate if you could fill it out. I'd like to give a big thank you to our speakers, Lisa, Denise, and Michelle. If we could all send them a round of applause using our emoticons at the top of the screen. All right. Thank you, everyone. And I just want to let you know if we don't have time to get to your question today, we will send around a Q&A when we email you the slides. So the first question, how do you recommend contacting Cochrane authors? The reviews do not have their contact information. The 
I would recommend going through the uh, Cochrane Review Groups then. They will have the contact information for the authors of the reviews that are, are okay, housed thanks, within Lisa. their and review And you group. can find the contact information for the re review groups on Cochrane.org. So the next question, for someone new and interested, where can they start? Is there a group one can work with to gain experience and knowledge? Yeah, that's a great question. I think just doing some background reading is, is the first place to start. I would go to the, um, I would first read the chapter in the Cochrane Handbook, which gives um, you know, some, some good basic guidance on uh, undertaking an overview of reviews. Um, there are some overview, or I guess review groups within Cochrane now that are accepting um, and producing overviews. Um, and they can provide a lot of direction for you as well if they, if the review group that you're interested in, in working with okay. actually is taking on overviews. Thank you. And sometimes we do hear of rapid reviews. How do these reviews fit in with overviews? Yeah, that's a fantastic question um, and, and, and one that is being explored by a number of different groups. Um, so I guess today, and I think there is some overlap, so I don't know that there's an easy answer to this question. I guess our focus in terms of overviews has been on synthesizing data from systematic reviews. Um, rapid reviews aim to do things more quickly, um, but don't always focus on systematic reviews. I know some will if a systematic review or multiple systematic reviews exists on the topic of interest. However, rapid reviews will also include other study designs um, such as the, the individual trials or um, non-randomized studies as well. Uh, so they are, while there is overlap, um, they are um, somewhat different undertakings. Um, as well as the overviews, uh, the ones we have done anyways, we very much follow the, the, the methods expected of a systematic review. So we would have two, pe we would do a comprehensive search, um, we would have two people screening, two people doing inclusion, um, data extraction with verification, um, typically uh, some quantitative analysis of the results. Um, in rapid reviews, depending on, on who's doing the rapid reviews, some of those steps may be modified. So sometimes they'll only have a single person screening or a single person doing um, inclusion. Some rapid reviews don't do any meta-analysis um, and um, some will take other um, shortcuts um, with the methods. Okay, and it looks like this question may have been answered already, but just in case, uh, because you can't grade systematic reviews, do you uh, have to grade the individual studies at the overview level? Yeah, I think that's a, a really important question and one that we're just um, just really getting into examining right now. When we first set out doing overviews, uh, we weren't the systematic reviews didn't involve grading the evidence at all. Um, so, so grade is something new that is seen uh, now more consistently within Cochrane reviews and something that we are grappling with. We need to keep in mind that grade intends, or the, the grade working group in gra intends that um, grading happens at an outcome level, um, so not at a systematic review level. It's really looking across the body of evidence um, and grading the, the strengths or the quality of that evidence. So I think um, there's two options that one can follow. You can either, if, the, if grading has happened at the systematic review level, you can use those grade assessments in your overview. Um, if you're using a subset of data um, that, that whereby the grade assessment would no longer be relevant, the overview authors may choose to grade the, the data that has been included in the overview. Um, but there are caveats around that. Again, you may be relying on what the systematic review authors have done in terms of assessing the individual trials in order to um, uh, do your grade assessments. Um, so it's an emerging area, an evolving area, and something that we are working on here locally as well to try and um, define some more specific uh, methodological recommendations around that. 
Okay, and Tatiana is asking, do you use the grade software? Your summary table does not have absolute effect, which is essential in classic grade tables. Yes, yeah, so that's another good question. And again, just because we have um, more recently been exploring the whole um, issue of grading and overviews, uh, this process isn't uh, completely well refined as yet in the overviews that we have been conducting. Um, the, the table that Michelle showed um, was based on grading that had been done in the systematic reviews. Um, and we were very familiar with those systematic reviews because we had done most of them ourselves. So it was um, a bit easier to handle than if it had been individual um, or an independent group of authors who had done that. Um, so in answer specifically to your question, we, we don't use the grade software as of yet in our overviews, um, but we're working towards uh, looking at how this can best be done in overviews um, and refining some methodological guidance around that. Okay, and someone else says, not sure I understand the point about choosing among reviews on the same topic. Is the point to not include all reviews on the same topic? I think that's a really good question and, uh, and one for which there isn't a right or wrong answer. What we've done in our overviews is tried to select one review on each topic and, and this has been facilitated by the fact that our focus has really been on Cochrane reviews so by definition there is only one review on each topic. I think it becomes a lot more complex um, when you include non-Cochrane reviews so there is the potential there that there are multiple reviews on the same topic. If you're including more than one on the same topic um, then as we've highlighted there's some issues that need to be thought through um, because if you're, uh, there is the risk that you double count studies and double count data and then may overestimate um, the effectiveness um, that you're claiming for an intervention. So I, I don't think there's any right or wrong in terms of whether or not you should include only one or include multiple reviews. I think you just need to carefully think through how you're handling those multiple reviews and if there is overlap in the component studies then how are you going to um, handle and integrate that data um, and report that for the reader. And how do you apply grade to an overview without having to go to the primary trials? Can you apply the grade criteria of risk of bias, precision, directness, consistency, and publication bias, or are there other criteria to consider? Well, wow, lots of questions around grade. <laughs> I don't know that I have all the answers, um, but it's certainly an area of interest for us and something that we are really investigating closely in our methodological work. Um, we have done some grading at the overview level um, and where we've relied on what the systematic review authors present. So we rely on their risk of bias assessments and look at them for the trials that we've included in our overview, um, but we don't we don't typically go back to those trials and redo, um, for example, risk of bias assessments or methodological quality assessments. We rely on what the individual review authors have presented. Um, we will have the data from the meta-analysis so we can assess precision as they have done um, and we can assess consistency um, as well as directness. So many of those things we can do looking at what has been presented in at the systematic review level without having to go back to the, the trial level. And to date, no, we haven't considered any of the other domains within um, the grade tool, uh, including the, the additional domains that can be looked at. Um, we've been looking at primarily the risk of bias or study quality, uh, directness, precision, um, and the fourth one that's escaping me at the moment. Consistency, yes, um, and uh, primarily as well because we have focused on um, reviews focused on randomized controlled trials. Okay, and our final question, have there been any overviews of reviews of diagnostic tests? Good question. Uh, we haven't done any. 
Um, I imagine there are some out there in the literature. Uh, the focus of our, our descriptive analysis was very much on uh, questions of effectiveness. Uh, so, so the reviews that we identified from the medical literature that had been published over the last 10 years uh, had the focus of effectiveness. So I imagine there are some out there, but I can't answer that specifically. All right, thank you very much, Lisa. Sorry, before we wrap up for the day, there are just a couple more questions that came in at the last moment. Uh, one asking, how long would you expect an overview of reviews to take? Is this similar to a systematic review? Great question. Um, and how long does a systematic review take? I don't know. Um, what the re one of the reasons we started doing overviews of reviews is that we thought they would be quicker to undertake than a systematic review. Again, because of a, a lot of the steps that have that you you rely on have already done have already been done by the systematic review authors. So in an ideal situation, you don't need to go back and do risk of bias assessments. You don't need to go back to the trials to extract data, et cetera. As Michelle pointed out, the search is more often a lot more focused and you're only looking for systematic reviews. So in an ideal world, the overview, um, as, as I think we've envisioned it, is a much quicker process than a systematic review. How long does it take? <laughs> um, I guess that's a $50,000 question. I don't know um, exactly how long it takes. Um, typically, we would do one in a, um, two to three months, um, but we have dedicated staff who can spend much of their time doing the overview. So it depends on um, how much time one would have available. Okay, thank you. And um, thanks, Erin, for pointing that out. We do have a few more questions if you're able to stick around, Lisa. Yes, I can stick around. Okay, if the objective of an overview is to syn synthesize evidence to answer a unique question, why wouldn't you just conduct the regular systematic review the way all the evidence would be included? Yeah, I think that's a good question too and I, I think a lot of it stems to efficiencies. So if somebody has already done a lot of the work for you, um, why start again from scratch? If someone has already done systematic reviews covering their interventions of interest, then again, um, if you can rely on what those systematic review author teams have done, then you don't have to go back searching for all the primary literature, um, re-extracting the data, uh, doing risk of bias assessments. Um, so I guess the, the main reason is for efficiencies. Okay. I've seen a number of overviews of Cochrane reviews that only repeat the evidence. Is there some way to know at the abstract level or early on whether it's just a summary rather than a syn synthesis of the evidence? Yeah, I think that's a great question as well. And I think um, bec we, we are seeing variation in how overviews of reviews are being done. And I think part of that stems from the fact that they are relatively new. Um, where we, and I think we do see a variation in terms of some just summarize the, the reviews they have found, um, whereas others provide more of a synthesis. Um, currently, the Cochrane Multiple Interventions Methods group that is looking at this area and, and, and helping provide methodological guidance around it is advising that there is more of a synthesis rather than just a summary of the component systematic reviews. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd just like to give one more thank you to our speakers, Lisa, Denise, and Michelle. And before you go, I just want to remind you that uh, the series continues in January 2014. We have Introduction to Concepts in Net Network Meta-Analysis on January 16th and an Introduction to Rapid Reviews on January 30th. Thank you for joining us today, and you can find out more about our training and events at ccc.cochrane.org.